afternoon, once again, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to our Ambassadors Forum here at the University of North Carolina in sunny Chapel Hill. I'm Klaus Larus, I'm the Richard M. Krasno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at UNC in Chapel Hill. The Ambassadors Forum brings distinguished diplomats and politicians to campus to enlighten our students and indeed the wider community in the Triangle area about global and international affairs. You may know that all our previous talks in our Ambassadors Forum, as well as the talks in our lecture series, uh, The US in World Affairs, that all these talks are available on our YouTube channel. Please watch our channel as often as possible, and please do not hesita hesitate to become a subscriber. It is totally free of charge. I'm grateful to our many sponsors for supporting this Ambassadors Forum. In particular, I would like to thank our excellent Center for European Studies, the History Department, UNC Global, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Triangle Institute for Security Studies, the Peace, War and Defense Curriculum, the UNC Institute for the Arts and Humanities, and not least the sponsors behind the Cresno Distinguished Professorship, as well as the West Triangle <coughs> Chapter of the United Nations Association of the United States of America. And, ladies and gentlemen, here is your chance. Here is a chance for all of you in the audience. If you would like to become a sponsor yourself, then please let me know. I promise I won't turn you down. In times of turmoil, aggression and crisis, it is perhaps particularly important to, import, uh, to expand our horizon and to expand our knowledge about global affairs. We are only too familiar with the crisis which has erupted suddenly in Ukraine and Crimea and perhaps beyond. Has a new Cold War broken out with Russia? And what can we do to contain the new East-West conflict? However, the Syrian civil war is also still continuing. The terrible suffering of the Syrian people has not abated at all. The Iranian nuclear capacity crisis has also still not been resolved, though some significant progress seems to have been made. There are also many other crisis areas in the world. We just have to think of the often constantly bad news that com comes out uh, of Africa. However, today we will focus on American and European relations with Syria and Iran and also with Russia and Ukraine. We are very fortunate uh, today to have an expert on all these countries in our midst. I would like to welcome most warmly Ambassador Thomas Pickering. Tom is a former US ambassador to Russia, India, Jordan, Israel, Nigeria, El Salvador and to the United Nations. So I assume he knows a little bit about international and global affairs. <laughs> and indeed, already this afternoon, in the course of an informal session with our students, uh, Tom was kind enough to share his knowledge and wisdom about global affairs. Tom Spickering has had a most illustrious career and he probably is the most outstanding and distinguished uh, American diplomat of our times. Tom Pickering holds the personal rank of career ambassador which is the highest one in the State Department. He also has been awarded the State Department's highest award, the Distinguished Service Medal. And he twice was awarded the Distinguished Presidential Award. Even more important, however, than any presidential award, of course, is the fact that in total he has received 13 honorary doctorates and other uh, uh, distinguished university uh, awards. Tom's diplomatic career has spanned five decades. Apart from having served as U.S. ambassador to six countries, no small task, I believe, in the mid-1970s he served as special assistant uh, to Secretaries of State William P. Rogers and Henry Kissinger. In the late 1990s he was Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs and thus one of the most important foreign policy thinkers in the Clinton White House. After his retirement from the State Department, Ambassador Pickering was senior vice president for the Boeing Company and at present he is vice chairman of Hills and Company, a consultancy firm. We probably all remember the appalling murder of Ambassador Christopher Stevens and three other Americans at the US Embassy in Benghazi, Libya on September 11, 2012. Tom Pickering was asked to chair the Benghazi Accountability Review Board on the request of Hillary Clinton, then the Secretary of State. Thus, Ambassador Pickering's career in international relations has spanned the decades from the 1960s and 1970s to the very present. There is therefore no better person to enlighten us about global affairs and what is actually going on in Syria and Iran, in Russia and Ukraine. We are delighted that Ambassador Pickering has joined us today. <laughs> 
In a minute, Tom will deliver a short presentation about American and European approaches to Iran and Syria, to Russia and Ukraine. Afterwards, we'll interrogate Ambassador Pickering a little and pepper him with extremely difficult questions. <laughs> I, have the great, I have the great pleasure to announce that Ambassador David Litt, the former US Ambassador to the United Arab Emirates and a great Middle Eastern expert, will join me for this discussion with Tom Pickering. Thanks, David, for coming along. Toward the end of this evening, there's the opportunity for plenty of questions from you, the audience. I hasten to say that students are also allowed to ask questions. <laughs> and in fact, students are particularly encouraged to ask plenty of questions. So don't be shy. And after this, there's a small informal reception just outside this room where we can all mingle and talk about global affairs. Last but not least, can I ask all of you please to switch off your cell phones and close your laptops and iPads. This would be greatly appreciated. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure and honor to present Ambassador Thomas Pickering to you. This is a little bit of an electronic nightmare, but we're gonna get it. The first time in my life I've had two radios hooked up to me, almost seemingly to my heart. <laughs> It's a delight to be here. And thank you, Klaus, for that very kind and generous introduction. I always say a little hyperbola goes a long way, and I'm very grateful for it. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be with you, and it's a pleasure to uh, undertake what is a fairly daunting task to do Syria, Iran, Russia, and Ukraine all in the space of some 30 minutes without leaving you with a welter of confusion and a number of ideas handled only in the most minimalist shorthand. Uh, all of that I hope to avoid. I think these are critical and important problems for the United States, particularly the new challenge from Russia. I'll try to give you a little bit of background, but more importantly, let me, if I can, focus on things ahead, something that diplomats often uh, try to avoid. Uh, but since I'm a retired diplomat, I now have the luxury of uh, making my own opinions as clear as I possibly can, um, and taking on some of the you know, ideas and thoughts that might lead us down a path that is a more peaceful projection of events than perhaps the daily uh, commentary on television, newspapers, and radio would lead you to believe. Uh, nevertheless, these are hard times and difficult challenges, and I will seek in no way to minimize it. Syria remains, as Klaus said to you, a killing ground. 125,000 people, more or less, nobody can count, have probably been killed in the three uh, and more years that the conflict has been going on. It began as a peaceful protest. It's now ending as a radicalized, multi-dimensional civil war uh, in which the primary victims of the Syrian people themselves. But there is more going on in Syria than that, just that. There is a serious radicalization going on uh, among the opposition to President Assad, uh, led principally by Al-Qaeda, but even by groups that have been rejected for one reason or another by Al-Qaeda. Uh, that particular set of opposition is now establishing, according to the American intelligence authorities, a new firm base for itself uh, outside of Afghanistan and Pakistan, and potentially a place from which to launch further attacks against Europe's, Europeans and the, and the United States. Uh, a third factor that is very, very important uh, in this conflict is the impact on the region. Countries such as Lebanon and Jordan are deeply troubled to begin with, but have now a serious new impact of, of fighting uh, just across their frontier and swarms of refugees. Perhaps nine million Syrians have been displaced and a large number of those have come across borders. Uh, this in many ways destabilizing uh, Lebanon and Jordan, but even more having an influence uh, of malign character uh, on Western Iraq and certainly on Southern Turkey and beyond. And then <clears throat> finally, uh, we have a situation in which violence seems to be getting nowhere with respect to a solution. Uh, two years ago, our Saudi friends promised us an early victory 
in a war if we would only provide mountains of arms to the opposition. Uh, that didn't seem to work. We were not participants in the early days of arms supply, but the Saudis were, and so were the Qataris. Uh, that hasn't changed the facts of the situation. Uh, radicalization on the government side has certainly been undertaken by the Iranians and by their allies Hezbollah from South Lebanon. It's important to note here uh, that the Iranians and the Russians continue to supply arms to President Assad. And while there may be momentary reports of gains in one form or another, I don't know of any responsible observer who is predicting an early end in sight as a result of the continuation of the Civil War. This puts us in a position for the future where the only feasible outcome that anyone can see on the horizon, and it is a long, long distance away, is some kind of political outcome. We all know that all conflicts end with political implications of very great significance. And we need, as others need, to try to shape these in ways that, in fact, do not deal us from the bottom of the deck the worst of all possible cards. Uh, I wish I could tell you that peace is right around the corner, that the United Nations effort led, uh, led by Lakhdar Brahimi, a former Algerian foreign minister, is ready to produce a peace settlement. Uh, but I can see a path ahead for a peace settlement, but I can't see a timing at this, sense, this stage which gives us a sense of immediate uh, gratification. There is certainly an urgent need in Syria for all the obvious reasons to have a ceasefire of some kind or ceasefires of some kind. Reports yesterday indicated that the government was trying to make ceasefires in place around Damascus. Uh, Brahimi tried a month ago to see whether he could create a ceasefire around Homs for the evacuation of civilians in the main. Um, and it is very clear that the killing won't stop uh, until, obviously, the killing stops. And that means a ceasefire. A ceasefire in itself is not an answer to the problem. It is not likely to take place on a general basis, um, but might over a time, in a kind of creeping ink lots approach, uh, actually produce some useful results. And that certainly ought to be an early and first priority. Uh, were a ceasefire to take place of some variety, uh, UN monitoring would be very helpful. The UN is in no position uh, to enforce a ceasefire, and neither is there any appetite uh, among other players uh, to enforce a ceasefire. Uh, a second stage would be the uh, most important question before Syria of a political variety. Uh, is there a new transitional government uh, that can succeed, take the place of, or over a period of time substitute uh, for the Assad government. Two months ago, Henry Kissinger said he thought the approach ought to be that President Assad would have to be in at the beginning, but not there at the end. And I think it's a council of realism. Any thoughts that President Assad would leave as a condition of or as a price for peace talks is certainly out the window. Uh, the opposition doesn't capitulate in order to have talks about capitulating. Uh, it doesn't work that way, uh, even uh, in the most uh, wild-eyed visions of those who hope for success before the negotiations. It is also, I think, important to think how difficult it will be to negotiate the departure of President Assad. Uh, interestingly enough, all four countries that count in Syria now in a serious way, the United States, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Iran, while they have many differences about Syria, share at least one common concern, and that's about Sunni fundamentalist terrorists and their buildup. Whether that can, over a period of time, become one of the central nexuses uh, of a peace arrangement remains totally uncertain now, but it is not something so far divorced from reality that it doesn't need to be worked on. There is no early vision in sight of new negotiations. Uh, they seemingly have died with Geneva too, as it was called. Uh, but I think that here, uh, there needs to be a continued effort to keep the process going. Uh, if negotiated arrangements for a transitional government are not possible, uh, interestingly enough, the Iranians have suggested that we might think about an election scenario. Uh, 
An election scenario which is purely for the president of Syria won't work very well. Uh, but an election scenario that could be moved in the direction of producing a constituent assembly and that would have two tasks for the future of Syria would work. It would only work, obviously, on the basis that there was a significant and holding ceasefire, uh, something that I've already expressed doubts about having done earlier. Uh, but elections for a constituent assembly would give the Sunni opposition an opportunity to meet the challenge that all Sunnis outnumber uh, other groups in Syria. Uh, and if they can hang together, they can certainly have a serious say about the future of the government. Uh, it also would give the Constituent Assembly the opportunity to choose the next government. Uh, possibly a technocratic government uh, might be a, a, a transitional arrangement uh, that would make some sense. Uh, and this would be the point at which Mr. Assad uh, would either be eliminated or step from the scene. Uh, not again an easy way to approach the question, but the legitimacy uh, of an election process that worked would have more influence, in my view, than the process of negotiations would have in seeking the vital changes that have to be made in Syria. And so that's what we face in Syria. Those are the obstacles ahead. Uh, those are the options that are out there before us. And indeed, those are the points which I hope uh, the United States will continue to support, uh, despite the fact that they remain a very long shot for the present time. Iran is interesting because for 33 years, the U.S. relationship with Iran was characterized by mistrust fueled by misunderstanding. That's not changed in any serious way. But we have had a breakthrough of sorts last November. Uh, the focus has been on the United States side, on the Iran nuclear program. And with the changes in Iran, uh, with the election uh, last autumn uh, of Mullah Rouhani uh, running on a platform of reintegrating Iran into the international community and seeking a way to resolve uh, the disputes over Iran's nuclear program, change has begun to loom into sight, if I could phrase it that way. I think it's important to know that uh, the Iranians remain deeply skeptical on their side uh, by the fact that they believe uh, the Western objective is regime change. And we remain deeply skeptical uh, that the Iran objective uh, is a nuclear weapon. In each case, uh, we are not there. I don't believe, in fact, that the United States and its friends uh, has the capacity to make regime change in Iran. I think that's up to Iranians, and I think that's where it will remain. Uh, I don't believe, in fact, at this stage, uh, given the constant reiteration of the uh, conclusion by both the American and Israeli intelligence community that there is no Iranian decision to make a nuclear weapon, that we now have time in a negotiating process to see whether, in fact, there is an opportunity <clears throat> to pin down an agreement uh, that can make that fact into a continuing reality, if I could put it that way. That certainly ought to be our objective. Uh, I think it's you know, important also to note that the agreement that was reached on November 24, 2013, uh, between the five permanent members of the Security Council with Germany, uh, with Iran, uh, was an agreement that those of us who have been working uh, on <coughs> Iranian issues uh, for some dozen years believed to be unlikely to be achieved, certainly in one round of negotiations, and certainly an agreement that advanced our interests way ahead of where we thought that could be done in any first stage of agreement. It was an agreement that ended Iran enrichment to a level of 20%, our most serious concern. And it's an agreement which, in fact, had the Iranians take their stockpile of material enriched to 20% and convert it in a way that no longer allowed it uh, to be rapidly uh, re-enriched to higher levels. It was an agreement that set a limit on overall Iranian enrichment, 
And even more, it was an agreement that said that Iran will have no more low enriched uranium below 5% at the end of the six months of the agreement that it has at the beginning. It was an agreement that introduced new, radical, and much more extensive monitoring and inspection of the Iranian nuclear program than any country in the world currently has. Inspection of everything from centrifuges and the manufacture of parts of centrifuges uh, to daily inspections of Iran nuclear facilities uh, to a situation in which the International Atomic Energy Agency of the UN, which conducts these inspections, also looks uh, at the upstream side of the Iranian nuclear program, including Iranian mining and the preparation of uranium ore uh, for further enrichment. It's an agreement that, in, in my view, was extremely important in freezing uh, an effort on the part of Iran uh, to build a reactor which was configured for the production of plutonium, uh, something that obviously represents a second route to a nuclear weapon. Uh, an agreement in that regard, uh, which is very important, even though Iran has not, to anyone's knowledge, uh, spent time to develop the capacity uh, to separate plutonium uh, from the spent fuel from any reactor so that it could be used in a nuclear weapon. It's an agreement, finally, that said the next stage is a comprehensive agreement between Iran and the six negotiating parties on the western side. Uh, that particular process uh, began uh, following the entry into force of the first agreement on the 20th of January. Two meetings have been held already in those negotiations. Holding my fingers crossed behind my back, I have to tell you, that those two meetings went further, faster, and with less difficulty than any set of negotiations so far between Iran and the P5 plus one that I know of. It's quite remarkable. Uh, what happened in the first agreement on February 18th, or first meetings on February 18th and 19th was there was full agreement on what a comprehensive agreement had to accomplish and which issues should be raised in what order in that agreement. The second set of discussions and negotiations took place a week and a half ago, and they began to address the most difficult of all problems. What should be the limits on the production of enriched uranium by Iran on a permanent basis? Again, seemingly from the reports, those agreements went very well. The Iranians could have objected, the Iranians could have thrown monkey wrenches into the effort, the Iranians could have insisted that if we discuss limitations on uranium, we have to discuss at the same time uh, the release of sanctions on Iran as a quid pro quo. They did not. Uh, they apparently want to wait and resolve that in good order at the end of the process. There are five questions that have to be discussed in a comprehensive agreement with Iran. One is limits on uranium uh, enrichment. That could involve the number of centrifuges, it could involve uh, the permanent level uh, of uranium enrichment to be achieved by Iran, it could involve what to do with Iranian stockpiles uh, of enriched uranium uh, now suitable for uh, the production of isotopes and nuclear energy, but happily not rapidly upgradable. Uh, the second question is what to do about the plutonium route. And there are some interesting ideas of converting the yet unfinished reactor uh, now focused clearly uh, on the production of plutonium into a different kind of reactor uh, which would more than meet Iran's needs for medical isotopes, the ostensible purpose of that reactor, uh, but be much less efficient in producing plutonium for use in nuclear weapons. The third set of activities is to expand and improve even more uh, the international inspection mechanisms to monitor and verify all of the arrangements undertaken. Uh, the fourth step, or the fourth arrangement, or the fourth challenge, is to take a look at what happened, principally in the Iranian nuclear program between 1998 and 2003, when there occurred, we believe, 
a set of activities incompatible with the civilian program, but unfortunately uh, compatible with the military program. I won't go into the technology issues here, uh, but the International Atomic Energy Agency in Iran are now talking about this with the idea of coming clean, if I could put it that way, on what was done, in part to help focus uh, monitoring and verification for the future on those kinds of issues that would represent serious violations of Iran's commitments on non-proliferation. And then finally, the toughest part of all, perhaps, certainly for us, how and in what way and through what process do we lift nuclear sanctions as the Iranians implement and incorporate the restrictions on their nuclear program they have to undertake? This will not be easy. Sanctions have been placed on Iran for 30 years. Many for violations of other international norms other than nuclear activities, and so they will have to be separated. Uh, things like Iranians' treatment of their own people on human rights concerns, Iranian support for terrorist organizations in the Middle East and objections to the Middle East peace negotiations. Uh, finally, if this process moves and gets ahead, it will, in my view, be a serious and major accomplishment. Uh, we don't know yet whether that's possible. But it will also present new challenges because there are a wide area of differences between Iran, the United States, and Western Europeans. Uh, these include such questions as, as Afghanistan, where we have similar interests, and Iraq, where we do, Syria, where we don't necessarily, uh, and many other questions that still are outstanding, uh, including some that I just mentioned on Iran's treatment of its own people uh, and indeed its interest in and some of its efforts to block progress in Middle East peace. Uh, these are big challenges. I don't expect that they're going to be easy, but it is clear at least that Mullah Rouhani understands that if he can make progress and get sanctions relief, he is likely to remain a leader in Iran. And if he cannot, we will see a new set of leaders, and in my view, uh, much less compatible, at least at this stage, with our interests. And now, just a few words uh, about Russia and Ukraine. This is perhaps one of the most serious challenges to occur in this century. It raises the prospect and the portent of a new Cold War. It is, in fact, a reflection uh, of President Putin's own objectives for the future of his country and how and in what way they have clashed uh, with those of our friends in Western Europe and ourselves. There's no question at all, I believe, that neither President Putin nor the United States wants a war over these issues. But it is very clear uh, that a number of steps have been taken by President Putin, uh, which we reject, and we reject for good reason, because they are steps uh, against Ukraine that he and his predecessors committed themselves not to take as early as 1994, when Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons inherited from the Soviet Union in return uh, for absolute guarantees from Russia and others of its sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity. And so we are at a difficult phase or a difficult stage. President Putin, in my view, has four objectives in mind for himself and for his country. One is he wants to be a major player on the world scene, like the Soviet Union, as he saw it. Uh, secondly, he wants to create for Russia a sphere of influence, certainly, in the territory of the old Soviet Union, perhaps absent the three Baltic states. And perhaps at the same time, uh, use those opportunities, as he did with Crimea, to incorporate into Russia areas uh, settled by and populated by a large majority of Russians, but not yet part of the Russian Federation. And he certainly wants to use his opportunities as a leader of Russia to stimulate a growth in new Russian nationalism helping to pull together the country, defeat his opposition, uh, deal with the issue of centralization, centralized government, 
in an otherwise very loose federation, something he's very much been attached to for a long time, and uniting and bringing together the Russian economy in its future. And then finally, he wants to use the opportunity uh, to kick the United States in his own domestic political efforts uh, to raise his popularity index when it slides down, uh, in part because there are Russians who demonstrate on the street against him and his policies. These are not easy issues to contend with. What ought to be our objectives in the region? Well, I'd certainly like to recover Crimea, but it does take a, a real trip of fantasy uh, to believe that there is an easy way to do that. And sometimes reality, when it hurts, has to be said. And so my sense is we can keep pressure on. We can hope for the best, but we have other objectives that I think are also equally, if not more important. The first of those is certainly to keep President Putin from using his significant military force now on the border of Ukraine from occupying eastern and southern Ukraine uh, now populated in, in the main by a majority of ethnic Russians who are Russian speaking. Uh, a new land grab, if you will. And that's very important. I think it's important for us as well to do everything we can in the Crimea uh, to permit the Ukrainians uh, to take their military equipment out and to recover their fleet, uh, to do what they have to do to protect Ukrainians and to protect other minorities in Crimea. And that might well involve the introduction of monitors from the European Organization of Security Cooperation. It might also involve, I think, on the Ukrainian side, the introduction of similar monitors for a parallel but opposite purpose of, in fact, ensuring that Russians in South and Eastern Ukraine are fairly treated. Uh, that not, as some Ukrainians have threatened, uh, to take away from them their right to speak Russian, or indeed to have Russian uh, as a language of Ukraine equal with Ukrainian. I think it's important at this stage not to provide pretexts, if I could say it that way, uh, for Russia and Putin uh, to act in ways uh, that we don't want, uh, and that we are not, in, the, in that sense, prepared uh, to try to block militarily. I think it is also important that for the longer future, uh, Russia ought to be, if we can make this happen, brought in uh, to a set of activities with the European Union and others, uh, jointly to fund the economic future of Ukraine. Whether Putin would in any way be prepared to do this, he was prepared to do it on a competitive basis before, I don't know, but he should be given the opportunity to do that. Um, and we should work with the Ukrainians and indeed with others to make sure that coming elections in the Ukraine, we have a temporary government now that was put in place when the pro-Russian president left a month and a half ago, uh, that that new government is elected on a basis which is open, free, and fair, where Russian-speaking Ukrainians and Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainians can participate directly and represent their own interests, and where the outcome hopefully will produce a government uh, that is prepared to consider not just majority rights, but the rights of minorities as the process goes ahead. This, in my view, is the best way to insulate uh, the future of Ukraine against further Russian intervention of the type that we have saw. Uh, these particular sets of efforts, in my view, need to be accompanied by escalating pressure. And escalating pressure certainly uh, means what I say. I don't believe now, with all respect, that the sanctions already imposed are necessarily of a degree of weight and of such significance that they're going to change Russian minds. I think over a period of time, we have to look at a couple of areas. One of those is certainly oil and gas, where 80% of the Russian economy is dependent on the export of oil and gas, and where, of course, that goes in the main to Western Europe. Uh, and certainly we have to bring the Western Europeans along uh, with the, the effort to move that. And that will only come at least partially when the weather gets warmer. And over a period of time, and it will take a long time, 
when Russia can obtain oil and gas from other sources uh, to substitute for what they are now heavily dependent on Russia producing. I think it's important as well uh, that we do what we can politically and diplomatically to isolate President Putin at the present stage. Putin wants to be in the center of the play on all world issues. And isolating him brings a price that a touches perhaps the greatest aspiration that he has. And I think that that's significant and important. And here, uh, Chancellor Merkel of Germany will be very significant in bringing on the NATO leaders and the European Union leaders to move the question ahead. I also think that as we go down this road, we will have to do something militarily. Uh, certainly to send the signal that we are not prepared to sit back and watch things happen that are not in our interest. Now, first and foremost, we need to support our NATO partners in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And we have done that. Uh, we need to put some military forces, as we have done in Poland, uh, to send signals that we are prepared uh, to back up our word. And we have done that. Uh, we need to consider positively helping Ukraine, both monetarily, and unfortunately that was turned down yesterday by the Congress, uh, and with some military equipment uh, to assure that the Ukrainians are not at a massive disadvantage in, in the future, uh, should anyone threaten them from the eastern direction. I think that we should begin to consider naval deployments in the Baltic and the Black Sea. None of this is going to war. Uh, but some of this, at least, is putting a message out uh, that we have our own limits and that we have our own strength, and we should not be underestimated. Uh, whether in the longer term future more serious steps should be taken, in my view, should come only after we have had a real opportunity to see whether a combination of pressure and indeed opportunities open doors, if I could put it this way, through which we would like President Putin to walk, uh, can themselves have an opportunity to resolve this issue. It is a very difficult and very dangerous situation from my point of view. And at the moment, I think the challenge is very much to our diplomacy, to our friends and allies in hanging together, to indeed attitudes in the rest of the world uh, toward an action that I don't think anyone would condone of moving a piece of one country's territory to another. And these are significant. And so let me end there and put on my armor for the grilling that's coming. <laughs> to Russia in the 1980s when, to the Soviet Union, when the Cold War was... The 90s in not, Russia, not Soviet. That's right, that's right. But the Cold War had just finished, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. The Cold War had just finished and the Soviet Union, the, the new Russia, was still under the impression of the old Soviet regime and it was to, to, to transition to um, <coughs> the post-Cold War era. Do you see any similarities between the Cold War era and Soviet leadership during the Cold War and how Putin is now running the country? Or despite his recent aggression, does he still, is he a new sort of Russian leader? I don't think so. I think he's very much a prisoner of, maybe a victim, of his KGB Cold War upbringing. I think he is a chess player. And no, that's not unusual for Russians, but it's unusual for others. And I think that he has made a serious mistake. I think that his moves on Crimea are tactical and short-term. And that the strategic efforts to deal with it have to be long-term and substantial. And this is the reason why in my talk I recommended that certain sanctions and certain other steps be taken to begin to send the signal. One, he will not be a major player in the world. Two, his long-term economic interests are very vulnerable. He has not used Russia's enormous income from gas and oil over the last 15 years to diversify the economy. He stuck with a mono crop, a very good one, oil and gas, but nevertheless he is as much, in my view, 
vulnerable there is he is able to extort using that uh, obedience from other people. And here's the way in which we have to face that particular problem down. So I think that there is a strategic question, despite the chess playing, uh, that we have to exploit at the present time. I think that all through the Yeltsin era, we had a different feel. I arrived in Russia roughly 15 months after the fall of communism. And with a very few exceptions, almost everybody I dealt with was a communist appointee, uh, a member of the Communist Party, and very much uh, saturated uh, with how to deal with those problems. And it was not an easy road to hoe. By the time I left, many of those people had changed. Newer people were coming in. There was a clear division in Russia in those days between the over 40s or over 35s and the younger people. Now we have lots of Russians who've never been around under communism. There are real opportunities. So Putin is hopefully the last of the old breed, the old guard. Uh, but he's around for a while. And unfortunately, he's our problem as much as the world's problem. And here is where we have to face off. The notion that we and the Russians are so antagonistic that we go back to a Cold War syndrome is, in my view, a very serious consequence of what could happen here if we are not able to use the tools I talked about to move the question forward. Thank you very much. Um, let me play devil's advocate for a minute or two. When I look at the world from the Russian point of view or through Putin's uh, eyes, then he will say, well, NATO expanded into my backyard. Even former parts of the Soviet Union, like the Baltic states, are now members of NATO. There's been talk in 2008 to make Ukraine a member of NATO. I can't exclude it from Putin's point of view that that will happen in the near future. The Ukraine may become part of the EU and NATO in the long run. So he feels, I would say, humiliated and taken advantage of by the West. When we now, we meaning the Western world, when we now say, oh, we have to isolate you, we chuck you out of the GA, we uh, put to sanctions on you, which will be painful, not so much for Putin, but for the population largely. Um, we put him, literally, really, we put him in a little corner like a naughty boy who has done a, a terrible thing and said, you only are allowed to come out if you reverse what you have done before. Uh, uh, that seems to be a highly unrealistic policy because Putin also needs his domestic support. If he reverses what he has just done, he would be dead domestically, uh, I would assume, in Russia. He would not survive that. So are we not uh, pursuing a policy of robustness towards him, which in the end will not lead us to anywhere? Don't we have to constructively engage with him instead of isolating him? Uh, engage with them, you know, have a platform like the G8 to talk to him rather tell him, oh no, you're not allowed to come anymore. Beautifully stated, Klaus, and I'll get you a job with Radio Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> um, two things. I agree with you that it was a mistake in 2008 and it's a mistake now and happily nobody is pursuing it uh, to seek rapidly to bring Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, into NATO. Uh, it's very interesting to me, just by way of illustration of this point, that when I go around the states and talk about Russia, the third or fourth questioner starts the question, the Soviet Union. As if the Soviet Union had never disappeared, and as if Russia and Soviet Union were exactly the same thing, and indeed as if the Cold War was still running. And so it's a mindset that we haven't divorced very easily. But there is a Russian counterpart, and that's the problem with NATO. That Russians are convinced that everything the communists told them about NATO and its aggressive efforts to surround them, uh, to lead to their extinction if they could, were very much still part of the game. And so each of us uh, is laboring under the remnants of two Cold War ideas <clears throat> that in fact are very divorced from reality. But we need to move on our side, uh, not to poke sticks at this particular issue. And so what I have proposed, and what I think will work, uh, is this combination of pressure short of military force.
But obviously opportunities, as you said, open doors, where there are ways to proceed that can involve guarantees to Russia and that Ukraine is not a threat, that there can be friendly relations, but he's not going to take it over, certainly not the way in which he has moved against Crimea, and that there is a, put a red line of some significance, but it is not going to be a dagger pointed at the heart of some part of Russia. And, and my own view is that Ukrainians and Russians can get along on this basis. I'll tell you one other story, which I told your students that I traveled frequently in Russia and spent a lot of time with Russians. Uh, a certain amount of that over vodka. But over vodka, I never met a Russian who didn't at some point tell me, when we talked about Ukraine, that he had a cousin married to Ukrainians. All Russians do. The second, however, is traveling in Ukraine, where I did so much less because I was not accredited there, but I visited friends. And speaking to Ukrainian speakers, and almost the first thing from the Ukrainian speakers was to tell me about 400 years of Russian occupation because they knew I was ambassador in Moscow. And so each one has got their own historical experience on this set of activities and they don't match. And it is extremely important, I think, in that part of the world uh, that the relatively peaceful state of relations uh, that has been preserved up until now be continued for the good of people on both sides of that issue. Um, and that there be normal trade and a lot of interchange between Ukraine and Russia, which is a natural set of arrangements. But let's hope for that. I don't know that it's gonna happen, but certainly that ought to be a reasonable objective for moving ahead. Thank you. Let me ask uh, another question, which then uh, transitions to the Middle East. The current crisis with Russia, never mind how it eventually will be resolved, uh, either via uh, the New York Times or via the Moscow Times, you'll find out. Um, do you think the Moscow Times happens to be a very pro kind of West English language Moscow paper? The better. Yeah. <laughs> um, we need Russian cooperation for the Iranian uh, uh, nuclear capacity crisis, also in the Syrian civil war and many other crises, you need Russian cooperation. Do you think the current crisis will impact that negatively or could we even use the current crisis to get better Russian cooperation in some parts of the Middle East? From what I've seen up until now, I think it's some of one and some of the other. In Iran, Russians attended those two meetings, played a major role. I see no evidence or sign of their putting, if I would call it, spokes in the wheel. I think it's quite interesting because if I had to evaluate Russian motivations with respect to Iran, they're clearly, they don't want another nuclear power, particularly one very close to their borders, uh, particularly one that represents Islamist tendencies and particularly one that might seek to ally itself with others. I don't believe that Iranians would be crazy enough to give one of a few nuclear weapons, if they make them, and I don't yet see them making them, uh, to terrorist organizations where they themselves would have limited, absolute control over where that might go. And indeed, uh, my experience has been that those few countries that have gotten nuclear weapons have only uh, two considerations when they get them. One, that nobody else ever get a nuclear weapon. And the other is a great quandary about what they'll actually use it for. So those are optimistic pieces, but they're important. I think secondly, with respect to Syria, to come back to the Russians, there I think the Russians at various times have shared our concern about the radicalization of the Syrian opposition, and indeed the development of what seems to be a new base. Al-Qaeda in Arabic happens to mean base, so it's not too far from the minds, as David knows, of the guys who are pushing this. But they need to be concerned because at various times, uh, people from Russia, particularly from Chechnya, have gone away and fought in wars like Afghanistan, Iraq, and second Afghanistan, and come back and become serious problems. Building up a large coterie of foreign Arab and non-Arab radicals in Syria uh, is a real danger, I think, for future stability.
and or the creation of a base which is protected. And so in effect we have a problem just like Pakistan. Pakistan having helped the Afghan Taliban now as one of their own. Uh, we having helped the opposition now have an Al-Qaeda problem. Uh, and I think we need to figure out what we're going to do on that. And here I think it's our Arab friends in the region who are perhaps capable of having the most influence. Certainly they have the most money to shovel into Syria. And perhaps those kinds of approaches are helpful once we can get it moving in the right direction. And certainly Saudi Arabia, which is itself has been attacked on a number of occasions by Al-Qaeda groups, uh, is in the lunatic position of supporting the increase of Al-Qaeda influence among the Syrian opposition while at the same time it went through a bitter and deeply divisive conflict in Saudi Arabia to end those people's influence and capacity to attack the Saudi regime. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lett. Uh, Tom, we, we live in an era that is arguably fraught with many ironies, tensions, dilemmas, and contradictions. You alluded to some of them in your remarks, and I'd like to delve into a couple of those. Um, and the first is uh, from the perspective of the United Nations, where, where you serve. Um, we live in a, uh, in a United Nations era since 1945 when the international community embodied in this, in this institution the values, the procedures, and processes for resolving a lot of the challenges that the world faces, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. And um, here comes one of those dilemmas in which um, the international community relies to a large extent on the United Nations to deal with the questions of Syria and Iran, uh, whether it's from the point of view of the IAEA or the Chemical Weapons Convention or humanitarian relief or the role of the Secretary General in the Security Council for Syria and Iran. And yet in the, uh, in the other theater with Ukraine and, and uh, Crimea and Russia, the Security Council seems to be hobbled and incapable of doing anything so to, uh, because of Russia's role on the Security Council. So, so to, um, to key off of what Klaus just asked you, uh, what, what sort of um, role do you foresee for the United Nations in responding robustly in Syria and Iran when for, uh, for the Crimea and the rest of Ukraine, it doesn't seem to have any traction. But I think that the role is different in each place. I think we need to keep in mind that the United Nations is not a monolith, it's a collection of member states. And particularly in the Security Council it is. Um, and there I think we're paralyzed, as long as we have serious differences with the Russians. And certainly uh, those exist in spades over Ukraine uh, and how to deal with that particular problem. Uh, and as we all know, the deal in 1945 was that five victors in the Second World War, Soviet Union now, Russia, the US, France, Britain, and China, uh, would have the opportunity to block any substantive United Nations Security Council action. They had objections to, and that's gone on. We have unfortunately been perhaps the greatest user of that particular privilege, although people tend to forget it in this country. Uh, but it is not a good example. On the other hand, it exists as a reality. So I would say the Security Council does not have, at this point, foreseeably a useful role. It was interesting that China split with Russia with which it has been glued on Syria, and to some extent on Iran. And the Chinese, I think, have a foreign policy, particularly in the UN, of kind of hiding in the bushes. Uh, and these bushes were Russian bushes. Um, and so that's interesting. But I don't think it's going to work very well. On Syria, much the same dynamic takes place. Even though the Russians have agreed uh, that the United Nations will appoint the Syrian mediator, negotiator, Lachgar Rahim, and that the Secretary General is not being blocked from supporting a peace negotiation process, um, and that there is a certain latitude 
uh, in Syria among both sides for some United Nations humanitarian assistance to go in. I think those are all helpful, but they aren't the answer. The answer has to be in a political negotiation which can move things ahead. And it would be nice to see uh, a unified Security Council effort backing up the mediator. And I think that would have more effect. And I think the fact that Secretary Kerry tried hard, and it did indeed did bring uh, the Russians along with the negotiating process and having the meetings, and getting both Syrian sides there in the last round was significant. And indeed, the famous case uh, of the Russians agreeing uh, with us to destroy Syrian chemical weapons was another interesting example of a period of time, perhaps when the Russians saw the process going in a way that they weren't particularly happy about and were prepared to accept a negotiating alternative or at least not block it was there. So tinges of hope, but not a lot of real progress there. Uh, in Iran, somewhat different. Certainly since the uh, secret, then secret underground facility near Qum called Fordham uh, was discovered three years ago, and the Russians apparently did not have intelligence telling him it was there, while well, we did. Uh, the Russians have been quite good on Iran. Uh, they have helped in the Security Council. Uh, three sets of sanctions were been approved in the Security Council, uh, certainly without their objection. Uh, we'd like to go further, but that wasn't possible. Uh, but our unilateral sanctions have had a serious effect. Uh, there's no question at all that the negotiations are taking place in a context where a principal United Nations agency is one of the key to success, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which has the expertise and indeed the role of doing the monitoring and verification. So the United Nations is not totally excluded in its own way from these two particular activities, but it is not there in kind of robust orders from the Security Council. Well, I've been in the Security Council. I know about robust orders. There are a lot of occasions when there are robust orders for the Security Council, and all the member states of the United Nations are pledged by treaty to obey those <coughs> and three quarters of them ignore them because they're de minimis or they're outside the scope or they don't like them. We don't want to do something in the Security Council, uh, which in the end is the reverse of what Winston Churchill once said about Lend-Lease. He said, give us the tools and we will finish the job. And the reverse is give us the job and we will destroy the tools. <laughs> and so we want to be careful about that. Uh, so overreaching in the UN has its own penalties that we need to be cautious about. Finally, there are contrasts. I was lucky enough to be at the UN at the end of the Cold War when we got a lot of Russian cooperation on dealing with the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. And that was very significant. Uh, there is a small phrase in Hebrew about the United Nations called Um Shmum. Hebrew is filled with abbreviations. And one abbreviation, um, stands for the United Nations. And I'll let you figure out what shum means. <laughs> Thank you. A, a parallel irony or tension exists in our seeking support of our European allies in both theaters. Uh, we have seen in Libya, for example, where the British and the French were far out ahead of others, the Germans not so much, um, and even in the case of uh, Syria and Iran, uh, we had very strong support from uh, from our European allies. I don't know that, that they figured out what, what is necessary to be done. We're, we're all in the same boat in that regard. But I think that there is uh, dedication and commitment to try to resolve the problem. But as you mentioned in your remarks, when it comes to um, uh, Russia in, um, in the Ukraine and the Crimea, um, the, the uh, um, unity or solidarity of our Russian allies, especially the British, the French, and the, uh, and the Germans, is beginning to crack somewhat. Uh, 
Uh, and we all are depending more on Chancellor Merkel to, to come up with some kind of middle ground. Uh, and the British are saying, uh, look, don't, you know, we're not going to take the lead, the European lead, in challenging the Russians. Uh, we all have to share in this. Uh, so um, I wonder if you could comment on the role of our uh, European allies and also on the regional, uh, the possibility for regional organizations to have a hand in this. You mentioned the OSCE, but perhaps the, uh, the Arab League or uh, the Organization of the Islamic uh, Conference. Uh, great, David. You posed a number of, I think, intriguing and interesting questions. Um, all at the same time. I would say that <laughs> India is not uh, Russia, that Qadhafi is not Putin. And the degree of difference in strength, uh, geographic position, uh, essential power, is such that it is not possible to lead from behind in Ukraine, where it was in Libya. I think that the president must have felt in Libya that Europe was closer. But he went back to an interesting formula that at various times in the Cold War we pursued, where we got our allies to step up, and then we provided the stuff that was not available from the allies, principally things like intelligence, heavy airlift, um, and that kind of support. Actually, in Libya, they ran out of bombs on the Allied side, so we had to help them with that. I think also, very quietly, but I think very importantly, we worked very closely in Libya with the Canadian commander uh, in terms of where he was going and how he was putting things together. And so what we didn't see in Libya was the essentiality of the United States, uh, but not the front page position of the United States. What we are now seeing in Ukraine, and I think quite rightly, is the essentiality of the United States in the front page position, because to deal with British and French reservations, we have to be there. We have to be there with now a more robust European leadership. And German foreign policy in the last three years has evolved from what I would call the turtle-like posture of the 50 years after the war, where the Germans were atoning. Uh, for the awful mistakes made by the Nazis, with which they were associated historically, if not in any way, I think, necessarily in policy terms, to a situation in which it became clear uh, that Europe was not going to be successful without a stronger German role in the lead. And with some care, and I think Mrs. Merkel has been good at this, the Germans have moved ahead in what I would call their bilateral influence with the major European players on critical issues of salience to the European Union and to the US-European relationship. So I don't see that necessarily as cracked or broken. I see it as vexed, uh, which is true for most things, uh, where you get into an unexpected situation where friends and allies are going to have to be asked to ante up uh, and to be part of the solution not part of the problem. I feel this can be done, uh, but I feel that we have a lot of things that have to be repaired that have gone downhill. I mentioned earlier NATO military posture, uh, which to some extent is heavily focused on the US and a few of the major contributors. We could take another example in an interesting way, uh, not Libya, but Mali. Um, and there, the French stepped up. And indeed, the French have carved out for themselves in and out of NATO, in and out of the EU, uh, basically the military role of engaging their forces at times when their former African colonies are going through the turmoil of revolution, coup d'etat, government changes, and terrorist attack. And to some extent, we ought to be very grateful for that They've been able to do some of it on their own. Mali was much too large to do on their own. And while it didn't get a lot of publicity, again, we provided most of the heavy airlift, a lot of the intelligence, some training support for African forces, some movement of African forces, which was very, very important. But the French stood out ahead. So we're developing a whole series of new ways of proceeding. 
which are not all traditionally in the same mode. I don't think that that necessarily is disadvantageous, particularly if the others are prepared to make, as they did in Libya and as they have done in, in Africa, more salient contributions, even though they don't have all of the answers. So I'm not in despair, uh, but I think it's a hard road to hold. And certainly the first challenge, as I said, is going to be can we get a meeting of the minds over the issue not just of economic sanctions, which is going to be very hard, but of what I would call the diplomatic isolation. Uh, and will Russia try through attractive offers to see if they can break this mold? And will, in fact, the Europeans succumb or not? It is very useful to understand that all European states east of Germany belonging to the EU and NATO have traditionally stayed with us over anything Russian because they had uh, too many years of Cold War <coughs> Russian occupation. West of the German border, it's a more problematic situation. But in my view, when it comes to real threats, such as take over the Crimea, we have a more persuasive possibility, if I could put it that way, of working with our Western European friends. And it was happy and useful that the president went, not just for the nuclear summit, the security summit, but for a whole lot of other conversations built in around this that I think are important. I think it's very useful he's going to Saudi Arabia because the Saudis are on the Iranian side much more uncertain about where we're headed and what we want to do. Just briefly cut in and then come back to you and then sure. open it to uh, yeah. the audience. Um, I think we Since I get paid for the word, I love to monopolize the conversation. <laughs> but I just advise. I didn't know we were paid here. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I used to get paid by the word. But I just advised your students that the best posture in diplomacy is to listen. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think regarding the security issues, you're pro probably very correct that there will be Western unity. Regarding economic sanctions, mm -hmm. economic trade, and gas and energy, I wonder whether Western unity uh, will really stay on that long. During the summer, it's relatively easy because we don't need that much energy. As soon as it gets cold again and the prices might be going up, we just have to look at the 1970s oil crisis where Europe was severely divided among itself and with the United States. So I wonder, is your view not perhaps a little optimistic regarding Western unity? No, I have said it's going to be very hard to get unity on sanctions. But I think it's imperative that we do so because it is the one, or one of the, th the three critical messages we have to find a way to send. All right, thank you. That's all. I mean, of course we can fail, but I think Europeans have to know and understand the consequences of failure may be worse than a cold bed at night. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think my microphone is about to die, but but I, I hear your mic has slipped the other way. No, it's the, two mics. The um, so, now let me just uh, take this opportunity to ask you, we did reach the subject of Libya as a foreign service officer. So, as a foreign service officer, um, I am elated that the shameless posturing by our Congress on the issue of Benghazi has been exhausted for now. I suspect that in a couple of years it's going to resurrect its, its uh, ugly head again. But I'm wondering, um, could you please uh, uh, tell us or review in the, as a result of the findings of the, uh, of the study of the commission, uh, what were some of the lessons learned from that horrible incident um, uh, for, for the Foreign Service, for the conduct of our diplomacy, for Congress's role in, in, uh, in helping to make sure that our diplomacy actually can function in the challenges of the Middle East for tomorrow. Thanks, David. I think that uh, one general statement, uh, a large share, if not most, of the attacks on this issue had electoral significance. And so as elections become more important, my own expectations is we will not see the end of Benghazi. But my feeling is that having been through uh, depositions under oath and public hearings and lots of opportunities on television and radio, that our report is holding up pretty well. And I would be the first to say that we did the best job we could with the information we had.
if there is new information and I haven't seen that, I'll be the first to join the queue to say, yes, we should change this or that. We did 29 recommendations, 24 of which are public. We did an extensive public report. If you're interested, you can read it on the State Department website. I would say that there were three or four trenchant uh, conclusions. Uh, one was that the State Department did not, in its decision-making processes, prepare well uh, to deal with Benghazi. There are reasons for that. None of them are, however, excuses. Some of those had to do with the temporary nature, the unusual nature of the State Department facility, uh, the lack, indeed, of ability to mobilize the kind of funding that would have been necessary, uh, a certain ignoring of intelligence. There were 42 incidents between April and September when the attack occurred, all of them one way or another having implications for foreign presence in Libya and mostly in Benghazi. Uh, and they seem to have been put on the side as more of the same rather than an escalating uh, uh, set of pressure points that was going to culminate in something more serious. So I think all of those things are there. Um, and they obviously involved uh, a failure to deal with the problems. In the longer term, uh, there was a report on the attacks on the embassies in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam in 1998. Uh, they made a recommendation that uh, each year 10 embassies uh, be rebuilt or upgraded. Uh, by 2005, that had dwindled to three. Uh, and part of that was the cost went up of doing that. Part of that was the Congress cut budgets. And while the Congress was loath to admit it, it's very clear that they failed too in some of their responsibilities to fund the kinds of changes that we need. And it was very important to note that both Tunis and Cairo had been upgraded. And Cairo was attacked four hours before Benghazi. Uh, and it withstood an attack with almost no difficulty, even though the attackers got in over the wall and got to the buildings themselves. Tunis, similarly, uh, three days later, had a similar attack. Uh, that attack was more serious. And indeed, one of the effects of that attack was that trash in a dumpster was set afire uh, and pushed underneath the air intakes of the embassy in Tunis. And the uh, system for purifying the air, which was clearly also oriented to gas attack, was so good that nobody in the embassy even knew that there was a fire burning outside. So we were very lucky with the technology we applied. None of that was ever applied in Benghazi. Benghazi was not in the chain for that. Benghazi, in fact, may or may not have stayed at the, after the end of 2014. Thank you very much indeed. I think it's time to get the audience involved. And if I, Tom, if I can ask you to sure. go back to um, the podium, as please. As long as you pick the question. Okay. I will. I will. I will pick the most critical and difficult question. Yeah, absolutely. But <laughs> so can I uh, ask for <coughs> the audience who would like to answer this question? Yes, please. The gentleman. Here. There's a microphone coming. Would you just wait a little? Could you please briefly introduce yourself? And yeah, my name is Warren Horton. I'm retired from New York City, and uh, just quite interested in foreign affairs. I'd like to address this question to Ambassador Pickett. Uh, you mentioned the Middle East. Do you have any comments on the current uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace process? Yeah, I do, and it's a succinct and very important question. I think that over the years, particularly in the last two administrations up to the time of Secretary Kerry, we have tended to want to run away from that non-process, if I could put it that way, rather than engage. I admire Secretary Kerry in particular because he has taken on uh, the onerous burden, but the very important task of seeing whether he can once again uh, get this process moving. Um, there are several things that he has done that I think have been very helpful. One of those is that he has so convinced the parties of the importance of this process 
uh, that we have had relatively few leaks and those leaks we have, we have no basis for verifying. Which means, in effect, that the parties at least are giving Kerry significant attention and his ideas significant attention, not to, to try to destroy them, as has been the practice in the past, by public discussion. And that's very important. I think, secondly, uh, Secretary Kerry has resolved himself in the direction of promoting a framework. This is in some ways analogous to and parallel with what President Carter did with the Egyptian-Israeli peace agreement at Camp David. Camp David did not solve the arrangements, but it produced an outline of what the central compromises would be in the critical questions facing Israel and Egypt. Uh, where Kerry is, I do not yet know. But I do know that a framework has potential very useful application in this process. One potential is, depending upon how it is uh, cast, that the uh, parties will know very clearly what it is the United States will not support because it is outside the framework. And one of the plagues of the process up until now has been that because the parties on both sides do not have, put it this way, the certainty of secure support in their own body's politic, that they have produced and continue to produce unnegotiable ideas as viable propositions. Partly, I think, to get rid of the process, but partly also to please their domestic audiences. And until that particular uh, facet of the issue is ended, we will not get to the point of the critical negotiations that have to take place. Well, the second value of a framework, and it is the opposite value, is it defines the channels within which negotiations have to take place. And that was certainly what happened with the Carter Camp David plan as Egypt and Israel over the following year negotiated out the details of that agreement. Uh, there is a third point here. Um, Kerry has asked each side to be prepared to comment on his framework proposal. This, in my view, is an interesting change. At first, I thought this is a disaster. We'll get nothing but negative comments. But in some ways, what he is asking them to do is to outline their concerns and he, I think, is then in a position to respond to these by saying these concerns will be central to the next stage of negotiations and be able to put in his pocket the framework. Uh, if he is not able to do that, then there will be one or two results. The whole process will die, or the U.S. will continue to push the process, which in many ways may force an issue. Uh, that took place in 1988 uh, with a similar effort uh, under George H.W. Bush. Uh, and that would in some ways uh, potentially result in either changes of leadership or changes of ideas of leadership. Whether that happens or not, I have no idea. But that is also a potential outcome. And of course, it is central to get negotiations to move uh, to have leaders who are prepared to work with the process, but even more, uh, to take the risks of compromise for success. I think finally, uh, while it is a long way away, uh, the Europeans have begun to talk about whether uh, the framework itself uh, might become part of the United Nations Security Council resolutions approved. There only have been two resolutions on the Arab-Israeli peace process approved in the Security Council of significance. One was 242, which is territory for peace. The other was 338, that negotiations between the parties have to solve the issue. A new benchmark uh, through the Kerry uh, plan, or whatever you want to call it, would be useful uh, as a continued basis for moving the question ahead. There the issue will have to be whether the United States would be prepared to submit its own proposal to the Security Council and support it there.
uh, something the United States would find excruciatingly painful if there are serious differences over this. But nevertheless, your proposal is your proposal, and it is not something that is a winking light, which is one day your proposal and the other day something you oppose. So this is interesting and important. I think finally there has been some evidence uh, that this process is seeking to make internal trade-offs. On the Israeli side, uh, some gestures toward the Israeli position in return from the Arab side, some gestures toward the Arab position. This I'm much less confident is a wise approach, but it's out there and if it's really true, and I don't know whether it's really true, it will produce the usual problem. Uh, that the leaders on both sides will pocket what they like uh, and clearly oppose what they don't like. And because the proposals are tilted, each side will have reason uh, to pocket one and oppose the other. And I would rather see a set, of, a set of proposals in the framework which we consider fair but painful uh, rather than acceptable in return for unacceptable on the other side. But that's a difference perhaps in negotiating strategy. And I really don't know whether it's true, it's just in the rumor mill at the present time. So now you know everything I know about that. <laughs> Are you optimistic? No, I'm where the president is. 50 50 chance. How's that? That's a good diplomatic. Yes, answer. sure. Yes. <laughs> because I frankly don't know, Klaus, and uh, to take a position on any platform about something you don't know is a crapshoot. <laughs> Yes, over there, the gentleman. Yep. 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 Uh, Brian Valex, semi-retired uh, professor of medicine. Recently on, recently on NPR, there was a professor of uh, international relations from Georgia who applied cognitive theory to the Crimea thing, and he said that we, when one loses something, it has a greater psychological impact than, uh, negatively than when one gains something. He applied that and said that he feels Putin felt very, you know, very, very psychologically affected by what he felt was losing Crimea. And I wondered if you think that that does have any role in his aggressiveness there. Well, I think that Putin never owned a criteria, a Crimea. A Khrushchev did, and he gave it away in 1954. Uh, so what I think Putin felt the loss over was that Yanukovych, who was president of Ukraine, uh, and purportedly his stooge, but somebody who he felt very antagonistic about, it was very clear, their body language was not good, and the stories uh, are pretty clearly that uh, Putin doesn't like Yanukovych, but he, Yanukovych lost his job as a result of pressure uh, from public demonstrators and other activities in the main square of Kiev, and in part because there was horrendous sniper attack, killing innocent people in demonstrations in the square. Uh, now, whether that was Yanukovych or whether it was, as the Russians charge, uh, Ukrainian fascists, we're still not clear. But it was Yanukovych who left the country, abandoned his purple palace, and went to Russia. And there's where I think uh, uh, Putin felt the loss. And I think perhaps in this particular set of issues, while individuals are individuals, and cognitive theory attempts to prescribe for all of us under certain occasions, uh, it is possible that Putin felt that what influence he had gained through Yanukovych was disappearing. Uh, the riposte against Crimea in my view, followed a pattern. And that pattern wasn't a long-term, secretly planned effort, but a recovery, if I could put it that way, from Yanukovych's disappearance and the seeming loss of Russian influence. And to some extent, some of the things that were done in Ukraine, which were invidious to Russians, including some effort to downgrade, if I could put it this way, the Russian language, and things of that sort. And I have not made a comprehensive study. So I think there's a kernel of something here uh, and that he was in a position uh, being in the neighborhood, having the military forces. He had 15,000 members of the Black Sea Fleet and base people inside Crimea. Uh, 
so he was able to take advantage of his tactical position there. I still think it's a tactical victory, and we'll have to wait to see how the strategic game plays out. Thank you. Uh, the lady there? So, I had a question about, uh, you brought up earlier about this encirclement of Russia and how it's an illusion by NATO, illusion. Um, so, my question was kind of the role of NATO and why Okay. Okay. Not on? Oh. There we go. There you <laughs> All go. right, so let me start over. Um, mm -hmm. So the role of NATO and the Warsaw Pact earlier. So the Warsaw Pact is obviously obsolete right now. So what is the legitimacy of having NATO still intact, present, and gaining more memberships? It's a very good question. And I think that the answers are fairly straightforward that NATO uh, in 1993 and 1994, certainly with the full support of the United States, uh, decided that on the basis of what was clearly requests from Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, um, the Baltic states, uh, to come become members, that it would open the door to those countries to become members because they had a traditional concern uh, that someday Russia might push against them and indeed use military force to take them over. Uh, they were not countries uh, except for the Baltics that were part of the Soviet Union. So one could see a dividing line between their status and countries like Belarus and Ukraine and Moldova. Uh, and so the door opened. Uh, they first became members of the European Union uh, but came as well into NATO. Um, there was a certain amount, I'll put it this way, of what I think was discontinuity. Uh, Gorbachev believes that he was promised no nuclear weapons there and none have been moved there. He was promised no NATO deployments of outside troops there and that's happened. Happily on a temporary but not a permanent basis, but nevertheless it is there. Um, and that he was promised, and I think one other no, that certainly they would not be used to pressure or push against Russia. Um, and I think that that's been less than clear to the Russians and certainly has raised questions about it. But that's point number one. Point number two is a rather interesting question. I can remember writing with Al Gore when he was vice president uh, in his car on the way from the airport to meetings in Moscow. And I told uh, then Vice President Gore that I thought one reason why we had to look at NATO and look at new opportunities and new roles for the future was that NATO was the only place in the world where friends and allies could muster 60,000 troops to operate together to deal with peacekeeping challenges and tasks in and out of the NATO area. And of course, in a number of occasions, certainly with the breakup of Yugoslavia, uh, certainly in Afghanistan, uh, NATO has played a major role uh, and their ability to operate together has been critical uh, to whatever military capacities they have been able to put to that task. And I think that's important. And so in that regard, NATO uh, in the main has worked on tasks that have received the approval of the United Nations Security Council, sometimes post facto and sometimes pre facto, uh, but nevertheless it has. So those are reasons, I believe, uh, to look at the question. Ukraine has now raised a similar but slightly different problem. And I think to some extent, it was not NATO that threatened to go in, but it was Russian perceptions of NATO uh, that raised that particular question as one that they were concerned about. NATO and Russia have had a partnership agreement since 1994. The NATO-Russian Council has operated together where Russia meets frequently with NATO uh, to discuss all aspects of how and in what way uh, they see the world jointly and what NATO is doing. 
So NATO has bent over backwards, in my view, at least to keep the Russian official mechanism informed of what it was doing and where it was going. And the notion that the Russian official mechanism is still concluding that NATO is a dagger pointed at the heart of Moscow is, in my view, hard to really believe as real, despite the facts of the slips, despite the uncertainties. There's no total truth on one side or the other here. And so this raises a difficult problem. This is why I believe it is time not to incorporate Ukraine or Georgia into NATO. And I think it would be a serious mistake to try to do so, quote, to send Russia a message. It will send the wrong message. But I appreciate your question. It is not an easy one because there are no, there's not total clarity on each side. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Brian Angelino, I'm a student here at Chapel Hill. I just wanted to go back to Syria real quick. Uh, what role, if any, do you see the United States playing in something like that? A, B, uh, how do you deal with so many different factions all vying for some sort of control of the government? Uh, and I guess kind of uh, adding on to that, how do you convince the side to, to agree to something like that? That seems like a very difficult uh, proposition. Yeah, Brian, they're all three great questions. I'm glad you asked them. One, I think that the elections would have to be conducted with a huge role by the United Nations. The United Nations has conducted elections in difficult circumstances. There would have to clearly be a ceasefire that was holding. And that in itself is at the moment a hard proposition to imagine, much less put in place. But let's say it happens. Then the, US, the UN has significant experience in holding elections in areas that have been conflicted and it knows the techniques and indeed the ways in which voting obviously uh, can take place, be counted on a fair basis. There are assurances through all kinds of activities and record keeping and transparency uh, that the outcome can be looked at in a way that's either good, marginal, or bad. Um, and that can happen. Secondly, I think that in a combination of ceasefire and elections to get uh, to the point of minority groups inside Syria. There probably will be, if it is successful, a serious obligation on the international community, and that means the UN here, uh, to provide at least some peacekeeping forces beyond monitoring uh, to deal with places like the Alawite homeland uh, in northwestern Syria. Uh, the group that represents 11 or 12 percent of the population, uh, but which is really the Assad religious group, uh, a group that has had a connection with Shiism, but are not exactly Shia. Uh, there are other areas where that same kind of activity would be very useful. The Druze sect, another offshoot of Islam, um, in areas south of Damascus um, and uh, toward the desert. Uh, could probably use that kind of support. They have stayed out of the conflict and tried to avoid engaging in it uh, because, in fact, uh, their judgment is uh, that doing that is the only way they can continue to preserve themselves in a very difficult situation. Thirdly, the Kurds, who live mainly along the Syrian-Turkish border uh, to the west of Iraq, uh, have been engaged in part in support of the Syrian government, of President Assad. Uh, and over a period of time, obviously, if the conflict moves in a different direction, they too, like the Alawites, might be in some danger. And therefore, some presence there has to ensure the stability. The Christians, unfortunately, are spread out. Uh, and there are very few areas that one would say are entirely Christian or close to Christian. Several small villages north of uh, Damascus probably ought to be protected. Some of them have been attacked. Uh, that's a difficult situation for them. But that would, I think, also be an adjunct to the process of ceasefire and elections. How are you going to get Assad to accept it? Well, the device of holding elections for a parliament in which President Assad is free to run, uh, but which after the elections has the task of naming the government, uh, leaves him free to be named, but unlikely if the Sunnis hold together uh, to ever have that happen. 
Uh, the question then will be, uh, will the Russians and the Iranians, after all the Iranians suggested elections, uh, be able and capable of working with us, a slightly different proposition than we have, but one that was not so far-fetched a little while ago as to be totally discarded, uh, can they be helpful in making that change? And here I think they can. It's been clear for some time that neither the Russians nor the Iranians are supporting the Assad regime because of President Assad. They're supporting it because, in fact, they've had friendly relations with this particular group. And what they would lose by having this group go out of power is not the presence of President Assad. Uh, it is a favored position. And what a process of negotiations could do would be to give some guarantees uh, that in the future, at least, they would not be totally excluded uh, from having a relationship with Syria. I would have no objection to their having port access in Syria, but it would be the Syrians who have to answer that question, and hopefully we could uh, work with the Syrians uh, to move that process ahead. After all, any kind of arrangement like that is going to have to involve gives and takes. Thank you. Um, So my name is Grant Taylor, uh, I'm a first year undergraduate here at UNC, and my question has to do with the Ukraine crisis. Uh, it seems at this point like the primary channel through which we can influence Russia is the sanctioning or somehow impeding of their gas and oil industry, a primary client of which is Europe. At this point, what sort of capacity do uh, we as the United States and our oil producing allies have allies have to shift Europe away from consuming Russian oil and gas? And if such efforts are undertaken, how much support can we expect from other nations, most notably the Europeans themselves, and in addition, the Persian Gulf states upon which the burden of production might fall? Oh, Grant, an, another very good question. As a first year student, you're going far. <laughs> um, substitution is a hard road to hoe. We have reduced now fairly significantly as the result of the production of shale gas and tight oil from shale. Uh, but we're not yet in a position to be totally self-sufficient, probably won't be. Uh, we may have some extra gas to ship, um, and that will have its own consequences. One, obviously, do we have the liquefaction facilities to move that gas into the tanker route? And is there enough uh, kind of reconstituting facilities in Europe to put that into the European gas system? Uh, Europe already has some of that because they get LNG uh, from places like Nigeria, uh, west coast of Africa, and other suppliers. I don't know the answers to those questions, but people are estimating to have a real effect it might take a year or more. There is a consequence of that as well. U.S. gas prices are perhaps as low as they have been for a long time. Uh, but with European prices high, and therefore uh, the impetus uh, to sell American gas to Europe, it will be the European prices that will, de will define the marginal price, and we will see higher prices here. Uh, the question is, of course, are we willing to pay those as well? And how does that fit in? The third question is, are there other sources where gas can come and oil can come? One, of course, is Iran, which we have now depressed down below a million barrels of oil a day from probably something like two and a half or three, but with a very serious potential for something larger. Iraq has gone up, I think, to three maybe. Uh, and so that's a backfill, but is Iran a possibility? Uh, could we help the Nigerians, which have a very, very low production rate, given their possibilities, improve their own efficiency and move their production ahead? Can Saudi Arabia, which can do up to 12 million barrels a day, but usually stays at nine, begin to fill some of the gap? And that's liquids, and I think the bigger problem is probably gas at the moment.